Welcome back to the Lantern Rouge Cycling Podcast here with Benji on our Tuesday night for a slightly different pod. This isn't going to be like the other team previews or reviews for 2022. This is more a women's world tour wrap up and just providing some more information on what's happening in the ever and fast changing women's world tour scene because we have so many new teams five new teams teams with new names like LABTC have become the UAE team we just wanted to explain what's going on a little bit and also cover some of the teams that don't have a associated be that a loose or firm association with a men's world tour team so obviously Jumbo Visma and UAE we will now be doing in conjunction with their men's teams previews but for the others they will be included here. But exciting times, Benji. I think it's just so many new races. We, you asked, I think, in the Uno X interview that how are they dealing with so many extra race days? There are 70 race days at Women's World Tour level in 2022. First gut impression, how do you think that will change racing? We already heard Brody Chapman say more breakaway wins is that what you see or what else do you think might happen as a result of that? I think the racing is going to change gradually. It won't change in one go. I think when it comes to races itself, we're going to notice that in the future, we will notice that groups, teams, rosters are going to expand as more race days are coming because uh, we've seen it in the Uno X uh, interview with Jens Hauglund when he was mentioning that teams will here have to expand because they can't do this with 10 to 14 riders. But you're right, in race, it's also going to change tactic-wise. Breakaways might be more formal because we might see more depth or more in-depth teams as the top level of women cycling rises that will drip through. The bottom level, the development is going to get better as well as a consequence. But I don't think it's going to be an instant change. I think it's going to be a gradual improvement of the county levels as well as a consequence and just the entire expansion and across the coming years i think we'll see that the tactics are going to be slightly different and i think that's something i'm very hyped about it's very difficult to pinpoint oh that's gonna happen that's gonna happen when this uh team expands when world tour expands and so forth what i'm curious about is or is the UCI, for example, going to add a relegation system like they did with the men's in the uh, in women's world tour scene, for example? Hopefully not in the same way as we've been quite critical about the men's cycling uh, relegation system so far. But I'm curious about those things as well. So many things can change and I'm hyped about it. Yeah, I spoke to a, a rider in women's world tour and we're talking about, you know, in advance of me setting up uh, my rider agency, just talking about the market, how it's changing. And she was saying, you know, there is some more money around now and the money is increasing it's a different environment to two three four years ago with these new teams coming on board particularly some with more money uh so that was really really encouraging to hear as benji said though read really the promotion relegation system there according to the uci rules there is a maximum of 15 teams that can apply for or have a will be granted a world tour license wins world tour license for 2023 we understand that lacole wahoo just you might know and notice a name change there. Lacole, our show partner, our title sponsor, now first title sponsor of Lacole Wahoo UCI Women's Continental Team. We understand they might be applying or will be applying for a World Tour license in 2023. Currently, there are 14 UCI Women's World Tour teams. That's five new teams since 2021. So almost a 50% over 50% growth in Women's World Tour teams. Is a perfect moment to become a World Tour team, right? You've got the first Tour de France fun. Paris Roubaix has just been announced. It's like the eyes are coming towards women's cycling at the moment. And I think a lot of sponsors are like, okay, well, we've got the first Tour de France fun. This is the moment to invest. And I think that plays a, a role in quite a few uh, World Tour investments this year. If I had, I would rather invest in women's cycling. I think there's higher ROI you can get because yeah. you can two three million euro budget maybe you boost it to three and a half four million and you'd be the top women's team if you, you know if you look at movistar benji they signed avv heavy she be the shortest favorite for the tour de france fan next year and like they'll be like this is the be- one of the best things we've ever done in terms of exposure um and, and sponsor roi so yeah women's cycling is it's looking really positive but those new five new world tour teams are ef Education, Tibco, 
SVB, who were previously known as Silicon Valley Bank, Tipco Silicon Valley Bank. They were a UCI Continental team, actually quite competitive. Last year, they even won a stage at Norway, I think. Uh, there's also Human Powered Health, who were formerly called Rally, stepped up. There's Roland, Koges, Edelweiss, Squad, which I'm less familiar with. Team Yumbo Visma, of course, they couldn't go straight to Women's World Tour. They had to spend a year at uh, UCI Women's sort of continental level, but obviously with Voss, they were <laughs> pretty good. Uh, they <laughs> now Women's World Tour and Unox uh, already have now jumped up to Women's World Tour. And a UAE team, ADQ, have taken over Ali BTC Ljubljana, as I said. So, yeah, what do you you think this is going to keep happening, Benji? Do you, do you expect now, as you already mentioned with the TDFF, do you expect the likes of even Ineos or other teams to be like, why, where are the odd ones out here? Why don't we have a women's team? Honestly, I'm not sure. I think uh, that completely depends on what the sponsor's interest is when it comes to the sport. I think there's still a, a difference in visibility between men's and women's cycling. Let's not, be, let's not lie about it. It's true. And... Yes, I think for people like us, we see the value in women's cycling because uh, like, we are actively following it and so forth. But I'm not sure that a sponsor like Ineos, Ineos is actively following women's cycling and understands the value of a uh, sport as women's cycling for that brand. So I'm not sure. I think it will keep expanding where teams might get interested and might be coerced by the public, perhaps, to start doing it. Because obviously a lot of teams have had criticism that they don't have women's investments and so forth. Yeah, I guess true. It depends on, you know, it's a global sport, different expectations in different markets, I suppose. But just a note on our show partner, LeCole, who produced performance cycling apparel produced at the base of Monte Grappa in Italy. LeCole have produced in collaboration with Wahoo a indoor training specific jersey and kit to keep you cool and focused on your indoor training sessions if that's what you're doing at the moment uh, so if you want to check any of that out it's at www.lacole.cc and you can use our special code for 20 percent off lrcp 2022 that's all caps for 20 percent off all local items Going now to the teams that we will be sort of previewing now, uh, Canyon Shram, who were very strong in 2021, were often animating races, particularly Kasia Nerviadoma, who's their best rider, but actually didn't win a Women's World Tour race and were incredibly lucky. Like I think if you replay this season back again, like just let me just read out Nuvi Doma's results. Ninth Strata, fourth Trophy Alfreda Binder, second Dwarves Duel, where she lost the sprint to AVV. Tenth Adam still, but she was the strongest there and it uh, Longo Borghini sold her. Second Flesh, fourth Liege, sixth La Course, third at World Championships, fourth at European Championships, and a whole smattering of other top 10 results as well. What was the problem, Benji? Where, why is it a case of just she just is a good puncher, but never the best on her day, plus doesn't have that sprint to the likes of Vollering or Voss who can back it up on the flat. I think you're pinpointing the right two things there. Well, first of all, the thing I noticed is that when it's finishing on a, a punchy finish where on paper she's one of the best, we mentioned that she's probably the best sprinter in the world on like a 1K, 8 9% climb, stuff like that. And... Every single time that happens, there's one person that's better, but that person that's better is not consistently better than Nivia Doma. She's consistently one of the better riders on that parkour, but just can't hit that first spot. And like you said, once it's a parkour that has a sprint finish after a climb, she's able to really dominate that climb or obliterate people on the climb, but usually they end up either sticking just in a wheel or coming back towards the end when it flattens out at the top. And if they go across that climb towards the flat finish and so forth, then usually someone's better after that because they're, they've are they got a better sprint. So it's a combination of the two, I think. Not the ideal rider when it comes to a, a finishing ability, but to be honest, she's a few percent of winning races. I know. And now with, like, for example, at Amstel, it's often the rider gets to her wheel and then hangs on and they're cooked like a, a, a longer Borghini. And then... Her sprint at World Chance was actually really surprising. Uh, but, yeah, she's their strongest rider in terms of transfers 
They have Hannah Barnes and Hannah Ludwig, the Brit and the German, going to the UNOX. UNOX signed a lot of riders from other teams. Oma Shapira went to EF Education, Tipco, SDB, and Alexis Ryan, I think, went back to America to race for Legion's women's team. But incoming, two very, well, three very, very strong riders, uh, Soraya Paladin, Ruyakas from Liv, both of those very active in the Ardennes, and Sarah Roy from Bike Exchange. He's like a more of a cobbled sprinter type rider who didn't have a great 2021. How do you think Ruyakas and Paladin will help uh, Nuvia Dioma, Benji? I think Paladin even was with ELB in that Hent Vavelhem move, uh, or maybe it was Ruyakas. You're right. I think you're right about Paladin being in that move. You're right. But also, I think she got fifth at Amstel. So. If you Damn. combine that, being in the final of races like Amstel with Nivia Doma, then you can play out two cards. You can play out a bit as D works like. You can react to more attacks because you don't need to react with Nivia Doma on every single attack, stuff like that. So it's going to strengthen the depth in those kind of races. And they've already got a solid squad, but sub toppers. So like in Amal Yusik, Often a very strong rider, 6 in RVV 2020, I think. And then the year after, she was in the... Just before the finals of the Hilly Classic, she dropped. So if she can get that, that few percent extra, she can be one of those riders that gets into the top 10, 15 of those races instead of top 30, for example. So on the brink of doing just that t- a tiny bit more in that aspect and combining having Paladin, having uh, Nivia Dolma, Having a rider like Amal Yusik in there as well, Royakers, combining that all that would probably mean that you have more people to react in the final and that Nivia Doma doesn't need to do as much work in the final herself and she gets to post that one attack when necessary and not when someone else makes a move. They also have uh, Maud Alderman, the young Dutch winner of the Zwift Academy, uh, the women's version of that. So she's got a contract with the team, 18 years old. She's been racing some junior races. She's very strong in that series. And so we'll see what she can do. They also, I mean, at least Shabby, yeah, and the other riders, Benji, like Amy Lusik, they, I think they can win breakaways in these extra stage races if they go to breaks. I think they're the sort of riders that can win. Uh, another signing, by the way, is Shari Bosoit, who is t- uh, 21. And she Track was like cyclist a, as well, I think. Yeah, they don't really. They haven't really had a sprinter. So uh, Sarah Roy and her, I guess, filling that role. Yes, yeah, certainly. I think Sarah Roy's uh, days of sprinting are definitely not done. She's once again, like you said, hasn't had the best season in the world. But if she can get to that consistent level again, then she can be valuable for this team. And like you mentioned, with honestly, a team that didn't have the fastest people, I think. Perhaps Barnes is also a quick one on the team, looking at her results in, what was it, Tour of Norway? Was she third somewhere? Yes, first stage, the stage that uh, Anderson got uh, second and Faulkner won. She was also second in that sprint behind, got fourth in a sprint in the uh, Auto Belgium Tour. So she was kind of that sprinty type, but adding on to that is definitely helpful. And Roy can also get over uh, RVV cobbles, you mentioned it. So... She's not obviously the, the punchy type of the RV cobble uh, people, but once she's in that race, combine that with a Shabby, who's also relatively good on cobble races, and Nivia Doma, who's also the leader on cobble races for this team, well, you've got more support then. Do you think that the incoming riders are better than the outcoming riders? I think so. I, th- I think so. I think Kane and Shram are going to be much better this year. or well, Not much better, but I think they should get more results or wins and there's another rider who factors into why i think that who's not a transfer but effectively feels like one chloe diget 25 year old yeah who didn't race in europe at all in 2021 she's recovering from that uh horrendous uh accident in the world championships itt in 2020 at imola where she sliced open above her knee and then she came back for the Olympics and definitely wasn't on and even said she had still has sort of lingering problems from it. She is a huge talent and I, I believe, I hope she'll be racing or ready to race in Europe this year if she's been able to recover from that. If she comes back in full force and they've got Nuvia Doma <laughs> and Roy on and Alice Barnes uh, and Ruyakas and Paladin, I think that is a much, much stronger team for just general one-day racing. 
Yes. Uh, what do you think Nivia Doma can do in the Tour de France Femme? Because that's the one place where I'm like, can she ride for GC? Is she strong enough on the longer climbs? No. Well, I, let's be honest. No. Compared to ADV, no. Like, she isn't yeah, okay, the strongest yeah. there on the longer <laughs> climbs. Can she win a stage? I need to review some of the sort of up and down stages in stages two, three, four, which get progressively harder. Some of them, I think I even tweeted it, some of them, one of them really, really suits her if there's an uphill punchy finish. So, yes, um, I'd like to see all those riders I just named at the tour. But, yeah, things looking up for Canyon Shram. We might have an interview with one of their riders uh, in the next month or so, just teasing that. Uh, another team that's become well it's now become world tour is human powered health who were called uh rally cycling before they uh, we haven't seen too much of them in terms of winning races or podiums at like women's world tour level that being said they do have some riders who i think can make a big difference at world tour level the first of which is olivia ray she's very very fast and she's 23 years old kiwi she j just i've told you already just watch out for her on that stage one of the tour de france fam she is very very fast they also have mika can you explain the mika kroger meme on the internet benji or the cult following because she's on human powered health just explain what the mika kroger insane cult following uh it's honestly fairly difficult to explain as it took the person <laughs> that started it or one of the people that started it about 30 tweets to explain the entire story so i'm not sure i can do it on the podcast here but basically she became a, a cult phenomenon for uh german cycling fans and it's incredible to see that she's now super hyped on the internet every single picture that she's on people respond mickey koger and so forth but she's also a pretty damn decent rider time trial lists she's performed pretty well in time trials and was in the mixed relay team with tony martin at was it world champs or olympics probably both she did both she won she won olympic gold well. in team pursuit exactly but also mixed relay at world championships i think in flanders so definitely a, a solid uh engine that she has i honestly don't know 100 percent what her other areas lie in. I would be curious if she has the ability to get into breakaways in the same way that you mentioned for the Canyon SRAM team, the ability of going to breakaways, getting that solo in. But I just need to see it, bef see it before I can tell you. But she's the, she's certainly good when it comes to her time troll, and I'll, I'll gladly see her do that well in the future. I think she won the Lotto Belgium Tour at some point. 2018? 2019. Very strong TT engine, big rider. Yeah. I see the she, like Benji mentioned in a break, the way Marlon Rosa won the first stage of the Serratizit Challenge, where she was in a break, counted, got away, too strong to bring back. That seems to be the way that uh, Mika Kroger could win stages. But, yeah, I think, Benji, this whole team for Human Powered Health, it's always tough when you first team up at World Tour level. I think their whole team should be focused on Olivia Ray first sprint stage of the Tour de France and see if they can take, imagine if they could take the yellow jersey. They also have Nina Bushman, who is a 24-year-old Dutch rider. She also, she won a few UCI races, uh, one UCI race rather, in 2021, the Tour de Feminine second stage, which had a decent field actually. Um, she won that in a group sprint. So they have some fast sprinters. She also won the mountain jersey at the ladies tour of norway and some other sort of consistent sprint results in french uh one day races personally i i'd love to see this team not only focus on the first sprint stage of the tour de france but in general there's a lot of like flat sprint stages in world tour and i think just trying to get at least one world tour win two world tour wins you never know that's already great. It doesn't necessarily need to be the Tour de France starting stage to be a successful team. It can also be smaller races, in my opinion. But it would be great to win it, of course. One of their best hilly one-day races looks to me to be uh, Barbara Malcotti, 21-year-old Italian, top 10 in Giro dell'Emilia, fourth in Tre Valle Varesine, behind uh, Sierra Garcia and Nalen. So she looks she young. She looks like someone that we should expect to see in their Liège team and perhaps in a break at Liège. But, yeah, that's uh, human-powered health. It's interesting to see. they got the – it's like UNOX, Benji. They have the women's team at World Tour level and the men's team down at Pro Conti level. But the next yeah. one who people might be already – or should be already familiar with, rather, is Liv, 
racing extra. And unlike Canyon and Benji, I'm a little bit concerned or down on this team for this year. Yeah, I'm pretty bearish as well. Looking at the people that went down, uh, went out uh, firstly, like Lotto Kopecki leaving for SD Works, Paladin, as we said, and Royak is leaving for Canyon, Bertizolo leaving for UAE, and Evie Kuyper is leading for the team we just did, Human Powered Health. Those are uh, some big riders to get out of your team, and I'm not sure they completely replaced that. Now, looking at the strength of their team, what was left, I think. The likes of an Allison Jackson was probably one of the strongest riders that was left personally. I also like Stultines relatively well on the team as well. She's also had some decent results. But when it comes to incoming riders, I think I'm looking at Katia Ragusa as one of the strongest riders on the team now. Getting top 10s at the Italian classics, like for example, Trevale Varzine and Giro dell'Emilia. At the start of the season, she's getting a top 15 at the Invevel game. But... I'm not sure this is like the results that shout a world tour leader for me. And do they have a better rider coming in? No, I mean, it's impossible for them to have replaced Kopecky. I mean, eight of their wins, Bertisolo, one of their wins. As you said, Jackson's probably the best remaining rider. She won one of their two world tour races at Simac Ladies Tour Stage 1. But yeah, it's, it's, I don't know, maybe it's a money thing, Benji, but... I'm not. I'm not sure. I just don't think they're. Um, the, the, like for example, Kopecky is already proven to be a top rider at Women's World to a level. Yeah. The riders they're bringing in are from other from UCI Conti teams like Park Hotel, Lotus Adal Ladies, AR Monex, and they're not proven top riders at World Tour level. So my answer is no, Benji. Yeah, I'm afraid so as well. Now. Do I see this team do well in races as a as a combined force? I think they've still got abilities to get relatively close places, but I find it very hard to see uh, victories happening left and right for this team. So I agree on that aspect, to be honest. I know, and they're not a lot of sort of young riders. They have signed Silke uh, Schmulders, who's a pretty young rider, and Amber van der Hulz, two young Dutch riders, but maybe they'll be improved really quickly. Um, but I don't know. I, I don't have the answers yet, and I guess breakaways which is kind of what they already did with uh Royakas last year is like oh Royakas and Paladin were really strong and I've kind of used in breaks often when they but yeah I, I expect to see those yeah. rise in breaks so that's live racing extra uh the next team who haven't stepped up to world two level but intend to uh, it's Lacole Wahoo and I'll be talking to Yanto Barker on Friday actually about some of the economic stuff we talked about at the start of this podcast, like why, you know, why, Lacole, are you investing in in women's cycling? Like, what are you seeing as, as the pathway for women's cycling? What do you see? What what do you expect from Lacole Wahoo? Um, they are, as I said, hoping to go to Women's World Tour in 2023. They won two races in two 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 dot two races with Joss Loudon. Tour de Feminine GC and the fourth stage with her last year. But she's actually gone to You Know X, Benji. Kind of, she got poached. Um, and I think she was kind of their best rider. But what do you see about, or what do you see with Gladys Verhulst, Jesse van den Bulke, yep. and Flora Perkins, Elder Morin, um, Marino, Eleanor King, and Elizabeth Holden coming in? Personally, I really like the transfer of uh, Gladys Verhulst. It's weird because, like, she's French, but she's got the kind of name that we should just say in West Flemish in Belgium, like Verhulst. But <laughs> I'm not sure it's really supposed to be a West Flemish way to be said. So if I said it wrong, my bad. I believe that she's a very consistent rider. It's not at top level, not every top level race, but let's be honest, Forfait Le Samain, des Dames, we've got winning Grand Prix Féminin de Chambéry. That's not a top level race, but. That's a race where she's beating Conti level riders, but don't forget that Conti level in women's cycling last year was basically 90% of the teams because there were like six uh, or five <laughs> World Tour teams already. So, yeah, in total, that's pretty damn solid getting top 20s in all these 1.1 and 1.2 races, uh, third at the road race in France, and just across the entire season, solid results. And Top 60 at Paris Roubaix Femme, top 60 at Omlop. That's not necessarily saying that she can be in the top 30, for example. 
this year. But if she gets that extra, like 5% extra, then she can move up a bit and can be winning more of those 1.1, 1.2 races. For a team that is not World Tour yet, that is good. Her best result, GP Lorient Agglomeration. Agglomeration, second. It's the Women's World Tour race behind Elisa longo yep. Very strong result, certainly. GP de Ploé. <laughs> that's how I call it, my bad. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> yeah, that's a very strong result. And I wonder, like, she's uh, she's finishing in a group there. Does that mean that she'd got a, a bit of a, a quick sprint towards the end? It has to be, because otherwise she wouldn't be beating the likes of uh, the entire group that she was in. Of course, with Lebecki getting eight in that race, that means that it wasn't a straightforward sprint. Otherwise... Lebecki would likely be getting a, a closer result towards the end, but a relatively good kick to get first in that group. So combine versatility on hills with the a bit of a kick at the end of races, and you've got Gladys for hills, then that's the transfer I'm most looking forward to at this team personally. Yeah, I think she's definitely one, yeah, gonna be one of their best punchers. But yeah, look, Wahoo, it'd be interesting to see how they develop this year, and also who they look to sign if they do move up to Women's World Tour next year. And they'll be trying to get as many points as possible. Um, oh, I guess I'm not sure about how the points will work with the UCI promotion from Conti to World Tour. But yeah, they'll be trying to get as many points as possible. And they go to many of the Women's, Tour race, women's World Tour races. So you'll see them at even in Spring, Liège, etc. Uh, the next team, new kid on the block in Women's World Tour, you know X pro cycling team. So many signings, um, over 10 new riders. Uh, Anina Artosolo, Suzanne Anderson, very strong from DSM, Eleanor Barker, Hannah Barnes, Rebecca Kerner, Julie Leff, the Dane from Stato Tizic, Joss Loudon, who I just mentioned from formerly called Drops to Cole, Hannah Ludwig, strong from Canyon Shram, Amelie Lutro, Wilma Olausen, me, Bjondal, Otterstad, and Anna Dorte, Dorte Island. Um, the Scandinavians will not be happy with how I went through there. But yeah, it's obviously <laughs> very Scandinavian strong with some Germans uh, and also a few Brits and a Finnish rider as well. What do you, where do you think this team will sit in the pack, Benji? And what do you think their strengths will be? It's looking like classics. Yeah, I think Susanna Andersen is the strongest rider. And when we look at her strengths... It's kind of divided. She's good at these like sneaky uphill sprints towards the end of a stage. For example, that initial sprint that she got second at first in the peloton, that Faulkner one that I already spoke about at the start of the latest tour of Norway. And when it when it comes to like the classics and so forth, she's not necessarily in the strongest riders there. I don't see her like getting a top twenty at an RVV all of a sudden based on her performances so far here. But that. If she can bring her back her 2017, 2018 results, that is definitely possible, but it's not noticeable recently. Now, what does light up for me is her result at the Ronde van Drenthe. She was still riding for uh, DSM at that point. DSM had a wonderful race there. She was, again, the strongest rider, the fastest rider in the second group, ahead of Caracon Sony and so forth. So that's relatively fast riders so i expect her to be the sprinty candidate of the team perhaps on some hilly sprints as well that she can be the candidate there when it comes to the rest of the team it's a curious team they've got a very divided team but i honestly don't expect them to be getting consistent top 20 results in world tour yet i think that's something that will need to happen across the coming years they've got a lot of young riders for example that Otto salo she's uh the only rider of our country on this team and she's only 18 i think she only became 18 a few months ago as well from 2003 i feel very old suddenly <laughs> jesus <Yeah>. christ <laughs> uh, but uh hannah ludwig's only 21 so crazy right yeah i feel like she's been like and susanna anderson 23 amelie lut Am- Am- amelie lutra 21 as ben you said a lot of young riders who are under 24 years old on the team then that's more experienced riders joss loud and i think they'll be uh, i shouldn't they'll be using the what shop tt stuff that so joss loudon's partner dan bigham owns what shop what shop became the supplier of certain tt equipment to the men's Uno X team, we saw Varan Skuld in the U23, I think, TT, using that equipment. I presume the women's team will be using that equipment as well. 
And obviously, Josh Loudon, with the support of LaCole, broke the women's hour record using an optimized setup uh, late last year. So look for Loudon to be going for some TT results on Uno X, uh, be that Clonet de Nation or any any TT results. I think just pencil her in for some good ones. But yeah, any, any last thoughts on the Uno X team, Benji? Honestly, just curious what comes out of it is we've seen Uno X already develop quite well in the men's circuit. So I wonder if they are able to do that on the women's circuit as well, perform as a good world tour team and perhaps in the future have another development team for a women's county division as well. So I'm just curious about the long-term trajectory of this team mostly because I know they're in it for the long term. Another team, the last team that we'll talk about today, which I will admit I, I don't know very much about. They were called the Cogius Metal Look Pro Cycling Team. They are now called the Roland Cogius Edelweiss Squad. They have a lot of Eastern European riders. They've competed. They won uh, three races last year, all in Turkey: Zabolinskaya and Dronova. They Zabolinskaya, you'll if you'll listen to me prattle on for a long enough period of time i pick her for like a top five in the like a olympics or world's tt every year she's 41 she came top 10 in the olympics games road race she's incredible <laughs> she's like the bala of women's cycling but yeah they've brought in four swiss riders i presume edelweiss is a swiss company so they've brought in four swiss riders not from other women's world tour teams unlike you know x who are poaching from other sort of top teams or signing not rather than poaching signing from other top teams uh and then they've had a lot of riders go out i don't know benny uh, this this team is not going to be a very good women's world tour team like what's i don't see the advantage here is it just they want the this is the only way they can get tour de france femme access I think that must be the reason because if I have to be honest, this is not a world tour team when it comes to the riders that are on it. Yes, Sabalinskaya can get very solid results, but she's only the single rider in the team that can get decent world tour results and it's not consistently at all. And I think the only uh, rider that I'm bullish about, that I know enough about to be bullish about is Ines Cantera. I think she got fourth at the Spanish road race and that was after San Esteban and Martin, uh, Martins as well, Sarah Martins, and... Navi Garcia? Probably, very probably, actually, because she wore the Spanish jersey the entire <laughs> year afterwards, so likely she won the Spanish championships based on that logic. <laughs> but uh, This goes back to how we started the show, and Benji talked about, are we, are we reaching right now too many women's world tour teams? Yes. This is the question where... Should the UCI, because the UCI, before they give a license, you don't just rock up and as long as you pay the money, you get the license. Does well, the UCI also do. do this? Well, exactly. Apparently you do <laughs> because if they're, I don't, I don't want to be too negative, but yeah, if you, if they were saying, surely this team should be proving more at Conti level or just the, on the circuit before jumping up to World Tour, if we're talking about being competitive uh, this year at World Tour level. I mean, John Over looks okay. 28 year old Russian, same with Sabal and Sky, but she's she's 41, and the other signings are very sort of untested uh, riders. So yeah, I I don't know. It's just one to watch. They'll be at all the women's world tour races. One will think they'll be at the TDFF. Maybe that will be just a testing year, and then they'll sign some more riders next year. I'm not sure, but yeah, watch out for Roland Cogis Edelweiss. Just watch this space, and maybe the UCI will also be like, uh, 15 is a little. It's a little too much, a little too many at the moment. Yeah, any last thoughts, Benji, on any of these teams, uh, the promotion relegation system? Are there any other Conti women's teams that are waiting in the wings to step up apart from Lacole Wahoo, who I already mentioned? Well, I just think that it's hard to pinpoint which teams are going to be interested to do it and so forth. I think we still need to talk about UAE and so forth in the UAE podcast and so forth. And there's some interesting things to say there with young talent there. But uh, I, I'd rather see, like you said earlier, I think the Kogias uh, team being World Tour is a bit too far for me personally. And therefore, I'd like to see Conti teams first proving themselves before they get a World Tour license and get to that World Tour division. Because otherwise, there's Conti teams that would deserve to be at classics more than a Kogias team, for example. 
And that's just my struggle with it. Yes, there's probably teams that are very much interested in uh, moving up to the uh, World Tour division in the future as well. And that's something that will come as a process. I think Arkea is probably one that I wouldn't be surprised if slowly but surely they are interested in actually doing uh, World Tour as well. But they're not on that level yet. The one team I'm like weird about is Serat, is it? It feels yeah. like the team that was behind. <laughs> I know you'd think with they got a big star and Lisa Brenauer and some other good riders as well. Yeah. Like, yeah, Katie Archibald, uh, but then again on the road, not top level. So yeah, like you'd think it'd be interesting to see who applies next year, Benji. I think Kofidis, Kofidis, Lotto, maybe Valkar. I'm not sure if you know if these teams have been expressed in, in intention. Otherwise, then ignore me. But Valkar, good. Serat is it and Arkea it would make sense that these sort of teams would also be looking to move up. If it guarantees TDFF access, I mean, you you would apply. Yeah, perhaps Serat is as being the clever one, knowing that they're so strong compared to other Conte teams that they think, oh, we've got the wild card anyway. What's the point? Maybe, yeah. I mean, exactly, but maybe that system gets changed. I don't know. But... Yeah, you're right. <laughs> I think we we think that system much. Even Park Hotel Valkenburg. I mean, there's a lot of teams now with that TDFF. I guess there'll be lots of wild cards for it, but there yeah, they'll be thinking we need to be going to that race to for our sponsors. But yeah, that was our women's world tour kind of wrap up and discussion pod. We hope you enjoyed it. Thanks to Lacole as always for supporting the podcast and keep an eye out for Lacole Wahoo in these races in 2022. But until next week. Ciao.